Hey everyone, welcome back to Logan Cabinet Shop for another episode of the Hand Tools and Techniques and what I hope is going to be a popular new feature of the podcast because it gives you the opportunity to get your questions answered right here on the show. You know, I get a lot of email from uh, readers of the blog and viewers of the podcast with lots of different questions about different aspects of woodworking. Um, in some cases, it's easy to answer those emails. In other cases, it would really be a lot easier um, to demonstrate a, a quick technique or, or something quick here in video format rather than writing an email or in addition to writing an email. Um, just because sometimes some of these questions can be so visual and so technique oriented um, that to see it done is, is actually much easier than to read about it. Um, so that's the focus of this new feature of the show. Um, it's basically a Q&A, so you can email me your questions and I'll do my best to try to answer them here on the show. Um, the idea is that I'll take two or three questions and do an episode of the podcast specifically for answering those three questions. Um, so we're going to start today with the first Q&A podcast and we're going to talk about uh, shaving horses, we're going to talk about when to sharpen your tools, and we're also going to talk a little bit about primary and secondary woods for your projects. So our first question for today comes from Tim and he wants to know about shaving horses, um, how they're used, how they're built, um, and, and just general, uh, general types of things that uh, they're handy for around the shop. So there are really two general styles of shaving horses in use today. Um, the first being the English style or Bodger's style shaving horse, which is the style that I've built here. Um, the second style being the continental European or dumbhead style shaving horse. Um, so what I thought we would do is take a look first at how the English style horse is built um, and then we'll just talk generally about the main differences between the English style shaving horse and the dumbhead style shaving horse. So all shaving horses are generally, they, they all operate basically the same way, whether they're the continental European style or the English style. By pushing on a treadle with your feet here, a piece on the top grips down and grabs your work on this platform. So you can see as you push, your work is grabbed in the platform here. Um, so in general, there, there's really not much to these things. There is a bench, typically a bench style, um, seat or you know a bench um, with some legs. Um, the legs can be driven through the top as mine are here. Um, it's a pretty common style. Um, they can be attached to the sides with bolts. Um, there's really no rule for how to make these things. Um, and there can be three or four legs. Um, the four leg version tends to be a little less tippy from side to side, um, at least you know in the front where the single leg um, would be. Um, but the three-leg version has the advantage that it will sit flat on uneven terrain. So if you want to go out in your backyard and, and do some shaving, the three-leg the three -leg version is probably a better option. It'll be a lot more stable. You won't have to find a flat piece of ground. You can even see here, even in my shop, this one wobbles a little bit. Um, and a three-leg version wouldn't do that. The second feature of um, all shaving horses is that they have some way to adjust um, the work surface. So this here, this piece here is the work surface. Um, in, the, my, in the English version here, there's just a peg that's driven through the bench. The, the, uh, it's like sort of a wedge shaped piece. Um, there's a peg that goes completely through the work surface, through the side of the work surface, through that um, pivot piece. Um, and that's what allows the work surface to swing up and down, to adjust for height. To hold that height, there's simply a, uh, a wedge-shaped piece of wood cut from the firewood pile. And by moving that further in or pulling it further out, you can raise or lower that work surface. Um, and then there's the, uh, I'll call it the treadle piece or the, the vise. Um, my version is all, all wood, but you can build this um, using bolts here instead of the dowel pin, the heavy dowel pins. Um, two uprights that pivot on these dowels or, or a bolt if you would rather. Some type of um, 
grip or or, uh, or foot rest that you can put your feet on to to push this as you're working um, and then a way to grip the work up at the top now you can see here i just used a square block um, i actually drilled holes in this to insert these dowel pins so these big three-quarter inch dowels are actually glued into the square block um, and then they're just held to keep from sliding out with these little pins um, and it spins to allow to grip work of different sizes. Um, and in this particular one, I don't know if you can see, but I've actually um, cut a notch here. It's just a V-shaped notch, and that lets me hold square stock up on the edge when I turn this down, and that V-shaped notch grips the square stock. So the primary difference between the English style and continental European style shaving horse is the way that the head is mounted. In the English style, the head is mounted to the outside of the bench and platform, whereas in the continental European style, the head actually pierces the bench and the platform. In addition, you'll notice that while in the English style, the platform is adjustable for height, in the continental European style, the head itself is adjusted for height and the platform remains stationary. The function of both of these is the same, however. The primary advantage of the continental style over the English style is that it's easier to insert and remove long pieces from the into the, the continental style because of the open sides they can just slide in and out whereas with the english style you have to pull the entire length of the piece out through the the front opening however because there's more space between the side arms and under the gripping mechanism in the uh, english style the english style seems to hold uh, wide stock a little bit better than the continental style which has a smaller gripping surface um, on the sides of the head. So the traditional use of a shave horse would be for um, using tools like a draw knife or a spoke shave um, to make all kinds of different things. Um, traditionally I think it's more associated with chair, uh, chair making and making chair parts uh, but really uh, it could be used for a lot of different types of shaping tasks. You can use a shave horse for shaping um, cabriole legs. Um, it, you know, it holds them great. There are a lot of different uses. It's basically, think of it as um, a, a, just another work holding device. Um, really, it's no different than a bench vise um, in concept. It's a way for you to hold your work solidly in place while you use different tools on that workpiece. So you can use it for draw knife and spoke shave work, certainly, uh, but there's no reason you couldn't use it for, um, for carving or for whatever else you might have in mind. And it's a great type of portable workbench that you could take outside in your yard or um, you know, where, wherever um, outside of the shop and be able to do some work um, and hold your work solidly and reposition it quickly. So the general concept is very simple. Your workpiece, you adjust the height of your platform um, or adjust the height of the dumb head if you're using that style um, and place the, the piece to be worked underneath the, the, uh, the vice mechanism and press with your feet um, and you can work, work that piece with a, a draw knife um, it's great work holding for working with a spoke shave if you're going to do some shaping. Um, any type of work, um, typically on smaller pieces, um, but that doesn't mean you couldn't use it to hold larger pieces. But anything um, where you want to hold the work solidly um, for any type of shaping um, or any type of work like that. The great thing about the, um, the shaving horse is that unlike a bench vise where a piece can slip around, on a shaving horse, the harder you pull, the harder it actually locks in, um, because as it's pulled, the as the uh, you pull on the workpiece, the head actually grips tighter. Um, so the force gets transferred through your hands and the tool down to your feet, which push harder, and also the the friction wants to pull this even tighter. Um, so it's a great way to be able to. Um, hold pieces, small pieces especially, um, to work on them. Um, repositioning is very easy. You can just move your feet, spin the piece, um, and work on all different sides of it. Very quick, very easy, um, and that's why it was so popular 
with chair makers. In terms of building shaving horses, the traditional method uh, would of course be using green lumber um, and building it from that. But by no means do you need green lumber. Um, you can see I built mine out of regular um, grade construction lumber and it works just fine. So really any lumber will work um, for building a shaving horse. Um, so don't think that you need to use green lumber. It really isn't, isn't necessary. In terms of plans, um, the English style Jenny Alexander's Green Woodworking Site um, has great plans for an English style Bodger's horse. Um, and there's actually two different options that you have um, based on those plans. Um, Jenny uses lots of, um, uses hardware from the hardware store, um, you know, bolts and, and things like that. Uh, but there's a version on there designed by Peter Follinsby um, for his work at Plymouth Plantation that doesn't use any metal hardware. And that's really more along the style of how I built mine using all wood. There's no metal hardware um, in my shaving horse. Um, the Continental style, there's several plans for those. Roy Underhill talks about how to build one using green lumber in several of his books. Um, so that's one place you can definitely check out. Um, Drew Langsner's Country Workshop also has um, plans and designs for a dumb head or continental style shaving horse. They think they call it the Swiss style shaving horse. The head's a little bit different um, than your quote unquote traditional dumb head style because it's not quite as large and typically just uses one board. Um, but in essence, it's a continental style shaving horse. So um, that's another great place that you can look for plans for a shaving horse of that style. So our second question for today comes from William and he wants to know, how do you know when it's time to stop and sharpen your tools, specifically tools like chisels and saws? Now, obviously the answer to this question is going to be highly subjective and the easy, simple answer is, well, you stop and sharpen them when they're getting dull. But if you're not constantly using your tools every day on a, on a regular basis, sometimes it can be difficult to know, okay, the tool was sharp. How did it perform three days ago? Well, when you come into your shop three days later, maybe you pick that tool up and it sort of feels sharp, but how do you know really uh, if it's time to stop and sharpen? So let's take a look at a, a couple of different types of tools um, and some, some subtle ways that you might know that it's time to stop and sharpen. You know, saw is actually fairly easy, at least in terms of a joinery saw, fairly easy to tell when it's dull. Um, simply make a cut with it. A good sharp joinery saw should leave a clean surface behind, especially a, a well sharpened cross cut saw. Now simply inspect the cut surface. The surface should be fairly smooth. Um, it's not going to be glass smooth like you might get uh, from planing it, um, but there shouldn't be a whole lot of torn fibers in there um, if you're using a crosscut saw. If you're starting to see a lot of very ragged surface, um, it's, it's very likely that that crosscut saw needs sharpening. Rip file joinery saws are a little bit more of a challenge. Really, you're not going to get a good clean surface from a rip saw, regardless of uh, whether or not it's sharp or how large or small the teeth are. Rip saws just simply aren't meant for making really clean cuts. Now in a dovetail saw, we really only need that saw to cut clean enough that we can assemble that joint right from the saw. But ultimately, the surface isn't seen on the finished joint, the, the sawn surface. So it's really not that important that it makes a clean cut. What is important is that the cut is nearly effortless. So when I'm using a dovetail saw, if I am struggling to get the saw through the cut, um, if I can't quickly start and make that saw cut with little to no downward pressure on the saw, then I know it's time to resharpen that saw. This is easier to tell usually when a saw gets dull in the middle of work. Um, if you, you use the saw you know, intermittently, um, and you haven't used it in a while and you pick it up again, it can be difficult to tell um, if the saw is dull or not. 
One way you can tell is if the if the teeth grab the skin of your of your hand or your fingers. If it just slides across um, and you know you really feel that the teeth are almost rounded, um, then that saw definitely needs sharpening. It's actually probably well beyond needing sharpening. Um, but if the teeth are sharp enough to just barely grip the skin and pull a little bit on the skin of your of your hand, um, then that saw is probably sharp enough. Large rip saws, once again, are really never going to leave a clean surface, um, no matter what type of wood you're using or, um, or, or um, how well it's sharpened. Um, these saws are really meant for rough work, they're meant for fast work. But the key word here is fast, so if the saw seems to be cutting a lot slower than it used to, again, if, you, if it seems like there's a, a lot more effort required to use the saw, if you need a lot more downward force, if it just feels like it's not moving through the piece of wood, it's likely that it's time to stop and sharpen that saw. Same thing for large cross-cut saws. Um, they're typically not gonna leave a really clean surface. The teeth are usually too big, um, and we're usually using those for rough work anyway. So as long as the saw is cutting fast, it's probably fine. If it starts to slow down, and you really feel like you have to power it through the cut, rather than let, letting the weight of the saw guide itself through the cut, then it's probably time to stop and sharpen that saw. So what about chisels? Again, the best way really to tell if your tools are, are dull, whether it's a chisel or a saw or a plain iron, um, is really perceived effort. How hard is it to use that tool? Is it more difficult for that tool to cut than it was after you first sharpened it? That's really gonna be your primary indicator. But Let's look at um, some work with the chisels and see some other ways that might tell us that the tool needs some sharpening. So here we are cutting out some dovetails. Um, and I'm using pine for a reason that I'll talk about in a second. But, um, you know, pine can be pretty, pretty hard on tools because the different, um, the different rings that you see here, the different colors are actually hard very hardwood, very softwood, very hardwood, very softwood. So um, it really requires a sharp tool. But if you're chopping this waste, and you start to see what I'm showing you here, this chisel could probably use a little bit of sharpening. You see, how it's compressing that softer wood. Um, so that's, that's not an ideal situation for sharpness of a chisel, and that's why I like to use um, pine to test for this. Now, in pine chopping dovetails, you're going to get some of this, even with a really sharp chisel, but um, it shouldn't be too severe, and you shouldn't be pulling out big chunks either. Um, if you start to see voids in this end grain here, then you really know um, that your chisel needs some sharpening. On the other hand, if we take a chisel that's been recently sharpened. Now you can start to see the difference. This chisel should actually be able to just push right through this end grain, and I shouldn't even really need to chop it. Now again, you can see you are going to get some compressing, even with a really sharp chisel, but the surface is much cleaner because it's slicing more than it is compressing. This chisel could probably use a little bit of sharpening. This one, I would use that a little bit longer. How about a hand plane? Again, very similar situation. Perceived effort is probably your primary uh, indicator whether or not your tool needs sharpening, but pay attention to the surface that the, the plane is leaving behind. If you start planing a board and the shavings are coming out really nice, really unbroken, um, the surface left behind is almost like glass, very smooth um, and, and working really well, and then all of a sudden after you know 10 minutes, 15 minutes of planing, um, things don't seem to be like they were when you started. The surface is a little fuzzier, a little rougher. Uh, maybe you're, you're getting little tracks left behind that could be indicators of a chip in the iron of the plane. Maybe it hit a knot or something and, 
and you got a little chip in the iron. Pay attention to the surface of the board and the perceived exertion of use. Um, with a smooth plane, it's not going to be very hard to push it, and, and it shouldn't be. If it all of a sudden starts to get a little bit more difficult to push that plane, it's probably time to stop and sharpen. Um, you know, and, and again, look at the surface of that board. If the surface of the board is clean and polished and free of fuzz, um, then your iron is probably fine to keep going. If it starts to get harder to push, if it starts, if the surface of that board starts to get a little fuzzy, maybe you're starting to get a little bit more tear out than you were before, it's probably time to stop and sharpen that iron. So our last question for today comes from Thomas, and he asked about primary and secondary wood choices. Now again, as with a lot of things in woodworking, this is highly subjective. In terms of traditional selections for primary and secondary wood, what we typically see is that primary wood is the species that you want to look at. And that's always the case. The primary wood is going to be the species, what you want to see, the finished piece of furniture, the look that you're going after. Um, typically for primary woods, we, in traditional furniture, we see species like cherry, mahogany, uh, walnut, sometimes tiger maple. Um, they were usually species that were fairly easy to work uh, with hand tools. Um, they were usually more expensive because they were uh, more beautiful woods, um, but they also typically required a little bit more work to, to harvest, to turn into boards um, and the like. So um, our, in traditional, a lot of traditional furniture, we see these beautiful woods that were used as primary woods. Today, most of the furniture that we use, that we build, um, especially the more contemporary stuff, a lot of those pieces are using what in traditional work we would consider all primary woods because of the way the woods are selected this uh, today mostly more for appearance than they are for workability um, in a hand tool shop we're interested in a little bit more than just the appearance of the board so i'm going to use um, a piece that i built several years ago um, as an example here this piece was built out of um, what the lumber yard said was African mahogany. I don't know exactly what species it was. Um, it could have been sapili, it could have been kaya. Um, there are several different species that are frequently um, called African mahogany. It just depends on what dealer you go to. But at any rate, for the primary wood, I was going for the appearance of the wood, the, the dark tones, the grain, etc. Secondary woods in a traditional uh, piece of furniture or in a traditional shop using hand tools were typically chosen um, mostly because they were easier to work with hand tools. Now in this case, for this particular piece, I used uh, soft maple. And soft maple to me um, is actually a, a sort of a, a underappreciated wood. Um, it has a nice grain pattern to it. It has a nice, a nice color to it. And it's fairly easy to work with hand tools. We don't see it a lot in period furniture, um, at least not as a secondary wood, but tiger maple that you see in, in period furniture, the figured maple frequently was a species of soft maple. So it was actually used quite frequently as a primary wood. In this case, I used it as a secondary wood. What are some other Good choices that you could use as a secondary as a secondary wood. Well, in my shop, I'll typically use species like uh, eastern white pine, or poplar, or um, cedar. These are all woods that are easy for me to work with hand tools. They don't require a lot of effort. They require sharp tools, but they're they're very easy and very pleasurable to work with. And they're also typically less expensive. If I'm paying six to seven dollars a board foot for a piece of walnut, but I have 30% of that project is on the inside of a, of a case and I'm not going to see it. Why do I want to spend that much money on the lumber when I can get poplar for $2, $2.50 a board foot or pine or cedar, for example. They're much, much less expensive. They're uh, much easier to work and they're not typically seen in the finished piece. So let's use a less expensive wood that's easier to work for those uh, non-visible parts. Um, so there's just a, a, an idea, at least in the traditional sense, of how we would choose primary and secondary woods. In a more contemporary sense, what we see going on is 
the primary and secondary woods are often chosen for how they look against one another. So for example, you might see um, primarily a, a, a piece that's primarily walnut and maybe it has some uh, maple panels in the doors or some maple accents for that, that dark light contrast. So that's another way you can look at selecting your primary and your secondary woods, you know, how they complement each other visually. Um, so traditionally, more based on workability and cost of the secondary wood versus the cost and workability of the primary wood. Uh, and contemporary furniture, really much more subject subjective um, and much more based on visual appeal um, and exactly what you're going for in terms of the appearance of the piece. So guys, thanks for sending in your questions. Um, and again, if you have other questions that you'd like to see answered on the podcast, feel free to email them in um, and we'll do our best to get them answered here on the show. I hope you enjoyed uh, this new format. Um, we will still be doing project videos and technique videos as well, but I thought this Q&A segment would uh, just be something additional that we could do here on the podcast that folks would enjoy. So let me know what you think about the format, um, and if you want to continue to see uh, more Q&A shows, please send in those, those questions, um, and we'll see what we can do about getting them answered here on the show. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time.